Hi, Kim. Hi. I just, firstly, I wanted to say thank you for early on, like in the movement meditation, you put your hand on my back and it's just like, <sighs> thank you. Like, um, for me, um, the story that you were sharing about your life, um, about home and about outside of home and inside of school, it's my story too. Mm. Um, but my story was um, a lot more violent. Mm. So like there was times where I'd get beaten up by gangs of 10, 15 with sticks, bats, boots, all sorts at home and outside of home. So like um, the biggest thing for me in my uh, consciousness and my awakening and I'm able to be free of all of these things and a little bit about what the guy was sharing with the ego and having this, having the status. You know, I've come to a space now of being able to let go, but the biggest challenge for me is um, mum, you know? Like, um, my dad, my mum and my dad were both physically extremely violent towards me growing up. And um, when my, my dad passed away about two and a half years ago, but um, maybe three months beforehand, I kind of stopped talking to them and I had no communication because it was just really, um, I just had, I just had, I had enough. And one morning um, I got a phone call from my mum and I could just tell in my mum's voice that there was something seriously wrong. And then she started to tell me like what happened over the week that, Ambulance had been at my house, my dad had been to the doctors and all of these other things and they found lumps in my dad. And um, I was in a meeting at this time and so I was like, okay, get dad to the hospital and I'll see you there. He didn't want to go. Stubborn dad. And uh, the kind of way in which I had to get things done was meet them with the same kind of intensity. <laughs> So like my words were, get him to the fucking hospital or I'm going to drag him out the house. And he heard that. And then he put down the phone and then he rang me back. We had this argument and he got to the hospital, we, you know, without me having to go home. So I met them at the hospital. Half an hour of him being there, he collapsed on the floor. And I had to scream for help. Help came pretty quickly. But then that whole two months, um, I was there by his side. Like literally 24 hours a day, I was taking care of him, taking care of my mom, taking care of my business, taking care of, if anybody knows like what it's like looking after someone in stage four cancer, going up and down with all of their, all of the stuff. It's just, it was just pretty intense. So I was able to be fully present for him and on his dying week, um, he expressed to me that he wanted to leave. Um, and everything was done in such a beautiful way, you know, and I made sure that he had a peaceful passing no matter what happened. But even now afterwards with mum, it's like we lived together for a little while, but then she had this whole attachment thing and it was like really deeply challenging. So I had to separate us. So I, I deliberately put her into a one bedroom because the conversations that we was having was that, ah, oh, if we have a two bedroom, you can come and stay. So mm -hmm. I was like, no. Um, but then I had all of this um, resentment come towards me from my mom, from my sister, from my family. I'm like the worst guy. Um, and I know for me and really for my mom, it's the right thing, you know, because um, now she's finding herself a life mm. and she's never been alone. Mm. But then through all of the stuff that I've kind of been through, like through my own personal life and the things that I've had to do to survive, like I have this um, degree of blame and like also like I've never really experienced the love that I need from my mum, you know, in the way that I need it. Mm -hmm. And it's like um, the way she wants to love me is in a way that just doesn't make sense for me. And it's like I'm constantly poked and prodded and it just doesn't feel nice. And even just maybe like a week before here, was having a conversation about um, some family stuff. And she just, my mum doesn't understand what attack means. Like when she's just outgoing with all of this expression, it's just so much intensity. And I'm like, I can feel it. And I'm like, 
okay, I have to have my space. So I, I deliberately didn't go and see her. But then I rang her before I came here and I said, you know, hi, I love you. And, um, but I tried to do the right thing, but it's like, I still want my mum. And I don't know how to maybe let go of all of these intense yeah. feelings and just allow her to be and allow myself to be. Yeah. So you're, you're holding on to an idea of, and we all have done this, I've done this myself, an idea of what love is. You have an expectation that a mother should love, love you this way and that way, and if they don't show that, then I'm not worth it, I'm not good enough, or whatever the story is. You have to see that that is an idea. Mm. She has a certain level of consciousness or unconsciousness in this, in this case. And that is the stage that her form is at. And you, as this growing presence and awareness, is to let go of all your ideas and expectations. Mm. If you keep on holding on to a certain image that you want your mom to be, that is causing you the suffering yes. right there, is holding on to that image. So you have to let go of the idea in your head that Love from your mother at the stage of consciousness that she is at, that it'll ever happen. It may not ever happen. There's a, a passage in the Bible where it says, forgive them for they do not know what they do. Your mom doesn't know what she is doing. My father didn't know what he was doing. They're out of reaction. They're in the unconscious state. But as long as you still hold on to that image, it's keeping you down as well. Yes. Into that unconscious state. So to, uh, in order to rise above that unconscious state, you, this is the image that you have to let go of, is having a mom to love you the way that you want to be loved and needed to be loved. Because that is preventing you from go moving beyond and going forward into your life and having also relationships. Because what you'll do is you'll take that image and that desire and that want of being loved that particular way, whatever that way is, the leave it to beaver family, perhaps, you know, whatever that image is. And you'll take it into your next relationship and your next relationship and your next relationship, and they'll never be able to fulfill it. Mm. When I, when Eckhart and I began our relationship, I didn't realize I had this, but I had certain expectations. Well, a lot of expectations of what a relationship should be like. And not only just a relationship, this wasn't an ordinary relationship. This is a relationship with somebody who has a higher state of consciousness, at least I knew that, than me. So he wasn't fulfilling them. <laughs> and I'm like, damn, he should, well, what's wrong with him? You know, why isn't he loving me the way that I want to be loved? And then I finally realized, oh my God, I'm wanting to be loved and having a relationship with an idea in my head. I'm not having a relationship with him. I'm having a relationship with an idea in my head. Hmm. You get that? You yes. heard that. We have relationships with an idea in our head, not with the other person, the actual human being. When I let go of those images and those expectations, I saw the love, which I saw before when I first got together with him, that was emanating from him. The relationship was no longer me leaning against him and wanting him to 
make me stand up when I'm the one that had to stand up and see what it was that I was holding on to and keeping alive in my own head and thinking, this has to be fulfilled this way, the way that I imagined it in my head. It's not. And sometimes the media, you know, and television, I mean, I grew up with Leave it to Beaver, you know, that sort of family. Well, my family was not a Leave it to Beaver family at all. And I thought, because I saw that in television, because they all look so happy, and now we get that on Facebook, you know, that sense of false happiness. And we're like, why am I not getting that? And we keep on holding on to that image when love is so pure and it comes out of the purity, not out of the human side of us, because the human side of us, if we have a lot of human side of us, it's not a pure love, unconditional love. That spirit, that awareness alone is unconditional love. So the unconditional love that you seek is within yourself. That awareness Mm. alone can give it. So I've often said, when we want to dissolve our pain body, we have to be willing to love it and accept it in that awareness. And in that state of awareness, we are unconditionally loving our pain body to death. Mm. Just got to love yourself, man. Mm. Through awareness, not through the ego cell. So when we have our relationship with our mother, yeah, there's that human level, and you were reminded of that human level, but it's our work, our job to rise above that human level and see that, okay, this is the state of consciousness that she's at. It's not her fault. Mm. It's the state of consciousness that she's at. But you vibrate at a higher state of consciousness. Mm. And if you, your work is to be able to grow that higher state of consciousness or at least continue in it and vibrate within it, and it's possible, it's possible that you may free her of her own pain body. She may rise to me too, she may not, but there's no expectation that she will either. Mm. Because your love for her is the awareness. So the conflict that I have is that um, when I um, was younger, like three, four years old, I used to, um, we used to have a shop as well. And um, I, ha- I used to run out of the shop and I used to make my own families everywhere. Um, and I would, they would find me just randomly like a few miles away from the shop just um, because just to find people. But I experienced so many people loving me unconditionally and just playing with me. It's like, why can't my, why? and then my internal conflict is, why if some other people can do it, why can't you do it? Well, you know how when you get into a relationship and it seems all wonderful and great and, you know, usually called the honeymoon stage, Mm. and then, you know, you marry them or live together, (laughs) and then a few months later you're like, oh my God, what did I get myself into? So we can have these pseudo families, but you don't live together. Mm. When you live together, it almost like it brings up something else, and it's kind of in a way meant to, so we can see and go past that. So, however you arrived with your family, this is, this is it. So this is what you have to work with. Mm. This is what you have to transcend. Mm. 